Ever have a big brand reach out? You're sure they've got to have a gigantic budget, but you have absolutely no idea what to charge? Well, in this video, I'm going to take you behind the scenes of a real coaching call between me and a creator named Josiah, and he realized that he might have been able to land the deal if he'd asked one critical question. Give me the overview of this next one. What, uh, what was the brand asking for? Um, like, how did you react to this whole situation? Um, first, they reached out. They said they were looking for uh female latin creators which when i read the email I, I said yeah i'm interested but i don't fit <laughs> what you're looking for and then it just went silent for a few days and then i think uh the girl's boss came back and said actually we're changing up uh we think you'd be a good fit and then i got on the phone with them too um and they were looking for eight instagram reels eight tiktok videos and uh it was going to be spread out over the course of like I think eight months or something like that. Um, and it was going to support this other creator that they've been working with and doing stuff throughout the year. Um, so we spoke on the phone, talk about that. They were open to ideas too. Like if I had an idea, they were like, yeah, the floor is yours. Like come with whatever you want. We're just looking for these specific goals and ideas in mind. Uh, and that was pretty much it. And then I sent them my rates and followed up. And again, it was just uh, out of budget. But now when I look back at it too, uh, even before our conversation today, like I know what I could have done differently in terms of the and the packages and the pricing. Let's let's hear it. What what uh, what do you think you right away you you would do differently next time? Well, first off, I didn't know uh, until you answered that one question in the community tab um, that if they want the same video but it's going to be on Instagram and then let's say TikTok that you would charge about like half for that second platform if it's going to be the same video. Uh, so I would have done that. I would have probably broken it down more than just giving them straight up what they're looking for uh even more maybe added a couple more packages at a cheaper rate and maybe have it like four and four and just have it spread out since i they were looking for like a supporting creator to that main one that they were doing something with anyway so um th that would have been a couple things and now hearing what you're saying about probing a little more and trying to get at the heart of like what they're really trying to do mm -hmm. and maybe this isn't the route to take to get to that goal would have done that too so those are three right there. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, well, first of all, I just want to acknowledge, like, those are three really critical learnings that you came to on your own here. Um, and I think that, like, I 100% agree with all, all those ones. Part of this is, like, uh, you know, coming back to their initial ask and interpreting it a, a little bit more here. Um, you know, there's this concept that we talk about your VATNA, right? Your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. And this is a very specific ask that they have right now. They are looking for a multicultural millennial foodie influencer, right? Like, which is what you are, right? And so there's not, there is a limited, a finite supply of that type of creator on the internet, right? And so um, as a default position, like, if I were you in that in this situation, I would think, okay, like I am perfect for this. And so it is my goal and my job to help them understand that as well as ensure that we can make this work from a budgetary perspective. And so, um, again, like we talked about earlier, I would definitely go back on that call. I would have asked about budget ranges. You know, it would have been very helpful to understand that they had, uh, what did they say? 20 K right. Is what I think what they said that they were after um, I submitted my rates with. and they said it was out of budget. Yeah, they did. But on the phone, they didn't say that. Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't know. I just knew they, they were asking for a lot for, for specific things. That was pretty much it. Totally. Yeah. Um, and so again, like, it's like what we talked about at the, at the beginning of the call, which is like, you know, a lot of times when brands are reaching out with these like very large ass, they're doing, they are doing probing and they're, they're basically saying, we just want to get a bunch of rates and we just want to see uh, how we can Tetris this budget amongst the creators that we're trying to hire. So if they're telling you that they have 20K for eight videos, probably they had 100K for five influencers or, or like whatever, if I'm doing the math, right? Probably something like that, right? And so your tasks when you have these conversations is to number one, try to assess roughly what that is, uh, but also understand that they're also doing a little bit of probing and searching and all this stuff too when they're asking th these questions. So it's totally reasonable for you to, kind of mirror that back to them and say, look, I, I cannot give you adequate pricing until you under, until you help me understand 
uh, what it is you're actually trying to accomplish. In addition, we talked about the different levers. In addition to some of these lower packages where we could have stripped a bunch of stuff away, um, probably in the first like um, package, I wouldn't even have given them whitelisting rights, even though they asked for it on the call. So we say, hey, here's, you know, maybe this one's going to be four TikToks and IG reels or whatever, but I'm not going to give you whitelisting. I'm not going to give you exclusivity, no paid rights, nothing. Then the next pass package is four and four, same deliverables, but you're going to get whitelisting rights for 30 days. Let's say they, on the call, they ask for three months or four months or something, something like that, right? You give them less. You say whitelisting rights for 30 days, <laughs> not, not three months, what you asked for. So it's like working them up to, you know, some of the uh, more aggressive packages, like packages four, five, six, this type of thing um, with this whole, you know, concept that we talk about in the program, uh, like price anchoring, right? Like helping them understand uh, like what's feasible at these different lower, lower buckets. And so, um, but again, like you said, some brands are very fixated on, you know, all five creators, what we, what we sold through our agency, what we sold through to the brand was that we're going to work with five influencers and all five influencers are going to be uh, doing eight videos and we're going to deliver 40 videos total to you brand. When I ran an agency, this is what this is what happened. When we sold a proposal through, we said we are going to guarantee that we're going to deliver to you 112 pieces of content across multi-platforms, all this stuff too. And so this is one of the reasons why some brands are resistive to change the number of deliverables is because they are beholden to what they guaranteed to either their boss or to their client if it's an agency. And so, um, you know, yes, it's frustrating. I understand that. But part of the task is like understanding if there's other creative ways you can still help them accomplish what they promised. Um, that makes sense. I will say on the phone, she also said, I think I was the only one, I'm pretty sure that they were looking at to do this. Cause they had their main creator. Okay. So like, again, I was like more in a supporting role with these videos. Um, right. and that they were pretty, pretty firm on wanting their, their 16 total eight and eight. Um, mm -hmm. do you still think it sounds like correct me if I'm wrong. If, if, if a, a brand or an agency tells you that they're, they're firm on the, the deliverables that you would pitch them something with less than that to show like what the rates would be like, instead of hitting them with a fat number that pushes six figures. Is that, yes, what, I'm, 100%, is that what I'm hearing? hundred percent because okay. things change all the time. They could tell you they're firm on eight and then they go and they have a conversation. They fall in love with you and your content and they're like, okay, well we really want to work with Josiah. So, okay, let's just do four. Like things change. Even if they tell you that things change after they have internal meetings. So you always want to provide them with packages and options that are in direct uh, like opposition to what they said they wanted. <laughs> like you should, you should always do that regardless of what they ask. If they tell you their budget's 25 K you can still give them packages for 50 or 75 or hundred K or whatever, just for edification. You can say, Hey, if it's helpful, I took the liberty of giving you an extra three packages. Like it's fine. Right. But you do want to provide again, you want again, going back to this whole idea of like, it's about this diversified stock portfolio. Like you would, I'm sure be just as thrilled knowing that it was 20 K. If you could have gotten this deal for 20 K. Um, yeah, maybe it's less videos. Maybe it's four videos, whatever it is, whatever you're comfortable agreeing to at that rate. But like you want to give yourself an out rather than having to be like, okay, sure. I'll come down to my rate by 80% to make this work. You don't want to be in that situation because that's t like establishing a really terrible price precedent so you want to be able to give yourself an out in these different packages you know so that you can you can agree to it with while you're still saving saving face and not eroding your own pricing power right yes and did you see the follow-up email i sent with uh new packages that were closer to their budget did you see that I too did. but then i never got i never got a response from that yeah so um you know Basically, what you came back with, you said, okay, 25K, eight TikToks, whitelisting, no exclusivity, reels, whitelisting uh, for, for slightly less. Um, and, um, you know, didn't hear back. This was February. From my perspective, um, they probably, they even though they said that they were only going to be working with you, they were probably having other conversations with other people. Maybe they were wanting to only move forward with one, but again, they, ha they have a budget constraint and they're trying to just assess people's like rough rates. And so I am, I am assuming that probably what happened is that at the same time as though, as they were talking with you, they were also negotiating with someone else. That person came in at budget and then they just move forward with that person and ghosted you. So I don't think it was like, 
personal. I wouldn't take like this is just this is the reality of what happens. They're, no, they're, no, no, no. And I, and I never do. The fe- they're playing the field, right? They're playing the field. Yeah, yeah. They're they have a bunch of different options. They're dating a bunch of people at the same time, um, and so just this one just didn't work out. And so again, I do think there are some some tactical things that we could have changed earlier on in the negotiation. The things you acknowledged a little bit earlier um, that perhaps would have moved this more aggressively towards your direction in terms of closing it with you. Um, but, but, uh, but I think you did, you did, a, you did great, honestly, um, you did what you could, but again, like you, you could see here one, one other perception thing is like, if I look at what you were offering for 125 K or even hundred K and what you were offering for 25 K, you came way down on your rate, basically 75 K for quite similar deliverables you're just not cross posting it basically right in their mind it's a perception thing it's like okay well this creator they we literally they don't even know what their rates are they're just highballing us like okay whatever <laughs> you know <laughs> you know what i mean so it's like yeah, yeah 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 it was it was it was thought out but i understand why they would see it that way for sure yeah so so like 100 percent. like i could see it's thought out and all this stuff too but like for them to experience that level of whiplash of them to be like, oh, he just came down 75K on his rate for like similar deliverables. <laughs> um, like to them, that is just kind of like, okay, like I, I don't know if we really want to move forward with this person. So um, it's neither here nor there, obviously, at this point. But again, that's why it's so critical to have these lower price packages so that you don't have to have this level of whiplash and you can pull them towards something lower if they have a lower budget. Okay, totally got it. Makes sense. Oh, and then just a random quick tangent uh, question. Yeah. yeah. Um, have you noticed in your experience running an agency or from other brands, do they care to work with creators who are more, uh, on camera and showing their face more, more identifiable? Or is that just, does that mean nothing? I'm really glad that you brought this up. Um, because for example, in this last scenario that we just talked about, about finding a multicultural creator, a, a Hispanic creator to represent them, uh, for a particular campaign, you being on camera and being visibly <laughs> of Hispanic uh, ethnic origin, um, that's important to them, right? Um, right. And so, uh, yes, like, a, like one other content strategy decision that I oftentimes advise creators to, to think about is like showing yourself more in the content. Um, you know, like showing your, maybe it's a sim- something as simple as like, your real thumbnail is not just a close-up gratuitous photo of the food, which is your niche, but also you're like holding the dish. That's your face. And maybe, maybe it's not every photo, but it's some, because again, um, oftentimes, uh, you know, when a brand is like searching for creators to actually partner with on a campaign, they're not watching all your videos. They're just like opening up your handle and being like, okay, this person looks good. They have good looking food. Oh, they're, you know, they, they, you know, are, are a person that we could partner with. Yeah. Let's reach out to this person. So it's as much a branding thing as it is about, um, you know, again, being some, an asset that they can repurpose on their handle. Right. So because exactly. oftentimes they won't they won't just because they could just go out and hire a photographer or a videographer or a food stylist or whatever to make food and like put it on their handle and all that stuff, too. But like, you no, know, you are a creator. That's one of the reasons why they want to pay you and hire you is to like utilize your name and likeness and like clout chase <laughs> basically. Right. Um, right and, right. and so, yes, like I, I think that if I were you one, another kind of, um, strategic move that I would make just from a organic content perspective is like just being in it more. Uh, I think, I think that'll, that'll be, that would be hugely valuable. Got it. Okay. Good to know. So we're not done. There's actually two additional negotiations that I helped Josiah think through and some really important mistakes that you need to avoid. So make sure to check out this video.